Welcome everyone. I see a few familiar faces. Thank you. Those of you who are joining, appreciate that. We are, uh, we're gonna rock and roll. I've got my, uh, <clears throat> my good friend that I actually went to school with is in and presenting with me as a co-presenter, his name, Larry Harrison. <clears throat> Hello. Larry, good to see you. Although you're uh, in Hawaii, stop showing yes. up. And, um, uh, and obviously you, you probably should introduce yourself a little further if you want. Go ahead. Um, my name's Larry Harrison. Um, grad, uh, conferred my master's degree, space studies, astronomy. Um, through American Military University, which is part of the American Public University Systems. Um, that's made this uh, research possible that we are working on now. I am currently employed by the Cyanotech Corporation, who has been a huge sponsor for us in the growth of uh, spirulina. And um, hopefully we can get this thing eventually launched up into space. Um, as Larry mentioned, um, he's part of the uh, APUS system, American Public University system, as well as I am. Uh, this is how I met Larry. Um, we would not be here today if it weren't for the help of a lot of people. Uh, a few of the logos here in front of you. Um, YU, big, a big influence as well for us. They're a, a public uh, supported charter school there on, on uh, Hawaii. And yeah. they're also part of our, our help. They are they were actually a, <clears throat> a big part. Anyway, and here you can see one of my, two, I, I just actually got off of a, uh, a mission. It was a, uh, an analog mission and uh, that's Rosa, Rosa Workhu. She is also a student at our university and that's her on the left. Uh, and then the star of the show is the spirulina on the right. Moving on. So, the, the goal was honestly just to assure ourselves that someone with um, uh, our level of education experience could, um, sorry, I fly, could actually grow spirulina uh, using a simple set of operating procedures and um, you know, receive it actually, you know, in a, in a kind of a hibernated state and then allow it to propagate. Uh, Hawaiian spirulina, which is what we're going to be discussing today, is also called Afrospira platinensis, and it's um, it's very hardy. It's a robust microorganism. It does propagate really fast, and you'll see here in a minute uh, as quickly as it was. It was it was impressed. Um, I was it, as it as it relates to its propagation. It moved along rather quickly. The um, uh, operating procedures were pretty simple. They didn't. Um, wasn't a lot of rocket science associated with it. Uh, there was a lot of testing and a lot of retesting and, and uh, watching, uh, making sure the conditions themselves were, uh, were ripe for, uh, for its growth. Spirulina itself is actually approved and is approved by NASA as being safe for uh, astronaut consumption. It is a, um, it is a source of nutrition and there are some other really highly useful things so um, um Mary, it's all yours yeah why why we want to study the spirulina um there's been some recent detections of nitrates on mars um in the mars soil um that indicates uh nitrate uh, or nitrogen fixation mechanisms existed early in martian history we believe in combination with some of those nitrates um, and the additional uh, Zerux um, nitrate feeds for, for the, uh, or the Zerux feed for the inoculum of spirulina will be able to um, help propagate and grow spirulina in situ on the surface of Mars. Um, and as Terry spoke of earlier, spirulina, um, he, he was able to support our, our theory that um, someone who is not a marine biologist can grow this on a trip from here to Mars um, and grow it quite well, um, as we'll see here in a minute. There are some good, uh, potential applications for spirulina. Um, it does consume CO2 that's in the air. Um, it does off-gas oxygen, um, which is always a positive uh, when we start talking about space. It's a possible source of feedstock or nutrition for the and a nutritional supplements for the astronauts. Um, 
in situ food growth is going to be huge as we travel beyond uh, Earth's atmosphere. And we believe that uh, spirulina may be able to help support uh, our astronauts uh, gain the nutrition and the uh, daily supplements that they that they need to stay healthy. Um, one thing, since we are Cyanotech Corporation uh, donated and they have supported our program, um, and we're proud to be part of the Cyanotech uh, uh, Corporation to have their support. They donated 500 milliliters of spirulina inoculum, and we sent the inoculum via FedEx um, next day air with a priority uh, stamp on it, paid a little extra for that, and yet it still was delayed in shipping um, for five days. It sat in California for two days and again in Memphis, Tennessee for two days, and we were really concerned with the inoculum's health by the time Terry was able to, to obtain it in North Dakota. Um, some of the stress that, that the inoculum went over, um, it had very limited gas exchange, um, had absolutely no source of light during those five days. Um, both of those items are, are absolute requirements for healthy growth um, and uh, of spirulina and just the life of it. Um, as we can see here, the inoculum was very stressed over those five days um, of travel. And we'll see in another slide or two that Terry's going to take a look at here soon, just how stressed the, the inoculum was. And we were unsure um, if we were going to be able to combat that and get it to grow. But Terry did an awesome job. It's, it's, it's funny, Larry, that you mentioned that. It, um, it had a, a very, um, it was malodorous too. I have to be honest. It, uh, yes. it did not smell good. It smelled terrible. I was actually very concerned. This was a big part of, of the mission that I was working on in, in the analog uh, there at, uh, by the way, it was the analog at uh, University of North Dakota, which is called uh, ILMA. And I, I was worried. I was there mainly for this and a couple of other plants that we were trying to grow. Uh, anyway, moving on. The, um, I'm gonna play this movie while I, I visit with you. Uh, this, was, this was actually <clears throat> day one, um, I, 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 excuse me, day three. I set it up with thought that, you know, we would you know, provide a, a source of light uh, I regulated the light considerably. I actually worked on reducing the light, as a matter of fact, uh, to bring it to life slowly. Uh, I wanted to be very careful with that. I was, um, I was monitoring uh, the uh, wavelength and I tried to average, I started at 350 and I averaged up to 550. Um, in Nanometer, of meter. Nanometers, yeah. yeah and, then, and then once I hit 550 for day three, I bumped it up and you can actually see how much brighter it is in day six. Um, same thing. I also removed a couple of the bubblers. I didn't feel like I was getting enough oxygen, um, uh, oxygen gas exchange. Actually, uh, it, it does really well in, in a, a carbon dioxide environment. Um, it, it, as you can see, um, day three, you can see that was, I think I, I might have seen five or six spirulina about that same size. And in all of the slides that I took, and then day six, you can kind of see it just exploded. It was exponential. And honestly, it was, um, it was a significant increase. Well, and, and Terry, uh, here, here in, the, in the two videos, you can see the coloration. Um, the, the coloration in day three video of, of the flask, um, it, it shows that this spirulina was extremely stressed. And then in day six, you get that nice, forest green color. Um, it's showing that, that it, it's starting to relieve its stress and really starting to propagate. And that's what we want. And really well. so yeah. you did an amazing job. And one thing that, that we need to note here, another important factor was that we did have limited contact um, through this. We, we had some initial contact about concerned about the initial health, but you followed the instructions and, and it was awesome. Yeah, well, we were you brought know, it back to life. 
Yeah, we were on an analog mission. So we were actually um, on a, a blackout for communications uh, with the outside world. And <clears throat> I, you know, as it, as it was, I had to really play with a lot of off the shelf things just to get it to propagate. One of which was, and you can kind of see there's a, an underlayment underneath the image on right, day six, that kept um, the vials, the flasks themselves at a constant temperature, 78 Fahrenheit. Uh, I usually use Celsius, but in this case, um, they advertised it as being 78 Fahrenheit. And it was a constant number. It was impressive that uh, it did as well as it did. It got cold in the hab at night, uh, in the habitat. The plant module itself, not as cold, but this, these first few days, I was being very cautious. On to the next slide. Um, when I did get there, um, Larry, and I'll let you take over in a second, but I did have to get up and, and play with uh, the habitat and the, and you can kind of get a, you get a good idea of what we were in as a module, a cylindrical in terms of it was 2.86 meters. So about what a rocket body would hold. Um, it was everything I needed and, and probably more, but I had to use all types of different things. On the far right, lower right, you can kind of see we were test we were testing any soils if we needed to. In this case, I was testing uh, pH levels for the most part. But go ahead, Larry. Um, yeah, Terry, you pretty well nailed everything here. Um, you've already spoke about some of your off the shelf equipment that you use. Um, Terry, I believe you said you use a small air pump um, and some some uh, plastic clear plastic tubing to aerate. Um, and, and keep a continuous slow, um, mixture going. It, it, it helps, uh, spirulina kind of float around and stay separated and not clump. Um, and, um, one thing that we noticed as seen, um, in the previous slide was that the number of our rod counts and, and, uh, the spirulina, it, they'll, they'll be in two shapes. They'll either be in a, a rod shape that we've seen in the prior slides, or they'll be coiled, real tightly coiled. And we like to see those rods when we grow it um, because it's easier to harvest that way. Um, and it's just easier to capture and harvest. So we, we did see the uh, rapid increase um, by day four of rod counts as we were uh, looking at them under a microscope. Yeah, it was um, off the charts, exponential. I was, <laughs> I thought we overfed it. Actually, um, it, interesting. I, you know, and because I haven't had a chance really to visit with you or Aaron, yes, uh, going over these slides. Um, you know, I, I'm, and and for the folks here in the room, I was only, I'm, I'm only back now two days from our um, our analog, and. Um, I was concerned. I, I, you know, I wasn't able to visit with you like I'd wanted to other than through email. And I was quite worried, but it, it was very, very healthy. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> speaking to, you know, about the, the systems themselves going to be very important. Once we're off world, we're going to have to have uh, heat. We're going to have to and need humidity. I know that the, that is a problem on, um, on ISS and, and beyond as, as we move out in, and into the uh, solar system, it's going to be uh, hard to get humid humidity into the eclis. And I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. However, we have a solution and we're going to discuss it here in a minute, but it's, uh, and it's a good one that Larry found. Um, well, now, and, and one reason why, why we like to see some humidity, one, another factor that, that Terry had some issues with there was uh, water evaporation. The spirulina was in the water and a little higher, a little higher humidity, and, and we'll get to that in a minute, a little higher humidity would help uh, prevent some of that um, evaporation. As we start losing the water due to evaporation, our pH counts start going up a little higher than what we may like to see. Yeah, you know, that's, um, that's funny. Still, you still we, able to keep them under 11, but. We do, well, we got over 11 a couple of times, and I use that as a, kind of an indicator of harvest day. And so I'm glad that um, that was one of the um, one of the SOPs that um, Aaron and you, you know, supplied. Yeah. To. Um, we, we were sharing the facility with uh, another experiment, 
uh, out of Momentus, Momentus.io, Lori Waters, who was also on the mission with us. Um, and she had uh, their, their system was a closed system. However, it monitored the environment very well. So I was able to use quite a bit of the data that, um, that she was able to gather through her, uh, through her device, which was very impressive. Uh, and here it is. Um, go ahead, Larry. Um, as we can see, the, the humidity varied um, between 25 and 54 percent. And that is especially the days that we were real low, the 25 percent to 30 percent range. That's when we've seen some uh, higher than what we like to see water evaporation from our inoculum. And um, you can see it down. As, that, as we again, as we lose water, uh, pH starts to rise um, and we don't like uh, spirulina. I'm not a biologist by any means, but um, my understanding is we do not like spirulina to be over a pH of 11. Um, so, so we were concerned about the evaporation. Uh, the CO2 in the, um, in the habitat stayed uh, between 400 and 2200 parts per million. And one thing that we noticed as the CO2 began to rise, I, I personally believe, it's, it, it's not a proven fact, but I do believe that as that CO2 rose due to the occupants in the room, um, and the fact that it was closed, that that helped, that's when we really seen a spike in growth. Um, and I, I think that that CO2 being present, those higher parts per million, did help our spirulina uh, health some. Um, temperature was fairly constant, um, and uh, spirulina does like the, the, those, that temperature range real well. And Terry did great in putting the heating pad underneath it. Yeah, this was the uh, harvest day right here uh, at the bottom of the big drop. That was day <clears throat> generation one harvest. Uh, we were able to get two generations harvested, um, but that was very interesting. And I'm seeing this as statistically as it, as it is now. And even down at the bottom, you can see the humidity dropped. Yeah. Terribly. Anyway, it was, this was a brilliant um, picture. Now, this, I think, Larry, is the solution that you and I, you came up with and found. I don't know how you found this thing, but that, uh, that was part of our literature review. OK, well, yeah. I'm glad you found and this. It. Yeah, this unit's been used before. Well, why don't you tell us a little more? about um, The uh, photobioreactor is a self-contained um, unit. Now, this one here has a very small capacity, um, but it's self-contained. It, it, it's going to allow gas exchange. It's going to automatically uh, draw our samples. It does have an optical density meter, so we can measure optical density and health of the uh, product. Um, it, it is uh, sealed. Like I said, this unit has been used on ISS before by a uh, university, I believe it was out of Germany. Um, they are expensive. Um, Qu Quinitec um, has now, they've they're producing a larger unit where you can actually have three different test um, samples up there uh, on the space station. Um, and this is our ultimate goal to, to be able to test this um, product in microgravity um, on a, in a mixture with a, a, a simulated Martian uh, soil, a regular uh, MGS-1S is what we're going to be starting our next phase of our of our research on next week and or next month in the uh, Cyanotech labs um, to see what how this grows. Um, and I noticed that I, I'll get to the question. It's very similar that we're going to have to ask answer here pretty soon. Um, how spirulina going to react to perchlorates in Martian soil? Um, so. I'll get to that question before long. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, we're almost done here. We can actually yeah. start in a second. But uh, the team itself was comprised of the Larry as a subject matter expert, Aaron Stamper, also uh, the biologist subject matter expert with Cyanotech. Uh, couldn't have done this without the help of APUS, American Military University. Uh, West Hawaii Explorations Academy, which is a publicly chartered school um, there in Hawaii. It's called Wayu, if anybody wants to know. Um, Wayu. So, way uh, yeah. No, way way <laughs> I wanted to say Wayu, sorry. Uh, and also Cyanotech have been a 
huge supporter. And clearly, at the end of the day, we couldn't have done this without um, our PI, Dr. Miller, uh, Jason Couchard, who might or might not be on this today, might be around, but uh, this was kind of one of his babies. Uh, Larry, thank you. Aaron, yep. myself, Christine was a big help. Uh, Dr. Murphy of Weya. Weya. And, uh, and his two um, students. So, Andy and John. And you, don't forget the University of North Dakota for letting us use their inflatable analog um, site. That was awesome. That was huge. That was so, Now, I did want to say we have the lunar uh, image on our patch that we had. We only had to do that because one of our collaborators, um, uh, Professor Wallace, actually had to do a study that was uh, in real time or as real time as we could get. So we, we transitioned a little in, in respect to just giving him some uh, leeway on that. But uh, anyway, uh, references for those of us who uh, care and are into that kind of thing, there they are. And then lastly, a dear friend of mine and also uh, um, an amazing artist produced this uh, this photo. Uh, those of you who may know uh, James, he's brilliant. And uh, you can follow him on all kinds of different social media. And by the way, that background picture is, uh, is a recent um, photo from, uh, um, I believe that was Perseverance. Anyway. There we are. On to, we're a couple minutes early. We can take questions now. There's a couple, Larry. Yeah, yeah um, I, can read the, I can read the questions for you guys. Not sure. okay. okay, so when utilizing Martian soil nitrates for plant algae growth, has the potential toxicity of Martian soil perchlorates been studied in the impact to spirulina cultures? You want to there. Go to, to my knowledge, as we have done our literature review, there have been some studies done on that. The spirulina probably will not like the perchlorates. Um, and the simulated soil that we are using, again, is MGS-1S, which is high in sulfates, um, does not have any perchlorates in it. Um, that is an issue we are hoping to be able to study the biomass after the next phase of our, uh, of our research to see what type of metals um, or other substances in the simulated soil that the spirulina may uptake and to verify the spirulina will still be healthy for human consumption. Um, there are some, some possibilities where spirulina may uptake some perchlorates and, and or, again, some of the other uh, metals that are in the soil to, while the spirulina at that time may not be uh, suitable for human consumption, if we can get enough stuff removed out of the soil, we are hoping to, uh, to maybe uh, condition the soil for vascular plant growth for other crops such as lettuce or tomatoes and so on and so forth. Um, but at this time, I know that I haven't really answered that question. I apologize. But perchlorates are, I believe, are not good for uh, spirulina growth. Okay. And what do you predict the main applications of spirulina cultures in space will be? I, I can uh, speak to that just real quick. And by the way, uh, Jen, thanks for the question. Uh, he, he and I and, and the team had a chance to visit uh, first uh, analog to analog mission that we know of uh, between the MDRS crew, uh, crew 228, and then yeah. our crew, Elma 1. And uh, it was a brilliant chat. So, Jen, thank you for the question. Uh, <clears throat> as it relates to its nutritional value, it's, it's significant. It's, uh, it's going to be a supplement, and we're not going to just all grab a big tablespoon of spirulina <laughs> and shove it down our throats, but, you know, as a su supplement for uh, you know, an, an additive to a, a, a maybe a mix of some kind or a pill form, uh, it, it, it's significant. I'm, I'm comfortable in using it as such. I, I would say that I would probably use it a lot a more than the average person. I'm really into my supplements. Um, most of my friends know that now. Um, you know, the, it, yeah, and it, it, it's spirulina is very high in protein, um, very high in vitamin one, uh, K uh, one and K two. Um, there are some other um, applications or, or other benefits of spirulina, um, which will be Terry. I believe uh, Aaron will be on tomorrow to wow. speak to those. 
Yeah, um, you mentioned. Don't want to get don't want to give too much of her presentation. Uh, right please more. don't. Yeah, because that's a good one too. So those of you who want to come back and, and kind of follow up on it, but uh, and Jen, maybe last little part of that question that uh, you inferred was we, we did use it as a substrate and uh, and a source of um, nutrition and feed for a uh, another set of plants, which I'll discuss <clears throat> a little tomorrow, but not much because it's it's research that we're literally just starting. We mixed it with the MGS S1 and we also mixed it with a, um, um, a, a basically a bonsai soil, which is a, a set of compost and stones yeah. and it it's doing well. I'm waiting for uh, the feedback from um, the university of North Dakota folks. They're supposed to provide me with some additional image imagery. So I can, at least I can show you. Okay, another question is, for light greater than 500 nm, excludes blue wavelengths. Does spirulina not respond to blue light? Uh, spirulina will respond up to uh, fairly well, up to about 700 nanometers. Um, again, this may be a question for Aaron, who will be presenting tomorrow. Um, and I apologize for not having the answer off the top of my head. Aaron is our true marine biologist, uh, subject matter expert. But we do know that we like to see the wavelengths between 500 and 700 nanometers for, for optimal uh, growth. Okay, another question is, you had to be curious, how did you prepare and serve your spirulina? Great, Terry, great. I'll let you answer this one. <laughs> Um, so what I had to, um, I had to use, um, micron bags. Um, I had to basically filter out the spirulina. Um, and I, then I, I actually baked it at 225, um, uh, Fahrenheit for two hours, which dried it out considerably. And then I ended up getting, um, on Per thousand milliliters, gener generation one thousand milliliters, I ended up getting 0.33 gram, um, a little less than that, 0.315 actually. And then in generation two, I was able to get um, almost, well, 30% more. I was a little over yeah. that. I was impressed with it. I, I did not eat it because um, I was studying it. However, <laughs> I did actually uh, drink some and I was told I shouldn't do that. So just so you know, don't drink. It. <laughs> and then in addition for greenhouse style growth spheres on Mars, what is the spirulina response to Mars UV presence in natural lighting scenarios? Yeah, it's not going to be good. Um, the spirulina does not, that there, there was a study done um, for the UV and the x-rays that uh, wavelength that spirulina would have to endure on the surface of Mars, they did not respond well. Um, however, that is a, another reason for the photobioreactors um, that we are looking at. Um, and some, some uh, universities, it's my understanding after reading uh, several uh, literature reviews on spirulina, have photobioreactors that are much larger than what we want to send them to the space station. Um, so definitely a photobioreactor would have to be used so we can present the, the proper wavelengths and protect the spirulina uh, of light, the proper wavelengths of light, and protect the spirulina from uh, any x-rays or UV rays that were somewhat protected on, uh, here on Earth because of our atmosphere. Okay. And then the last question, not necessarily spirulina related, but here on Earth, the air goes from the bottom to the top because of the gravity. What about in space? I think that asks, that goes right to your PBR, the photobioreactor. We're, we're going to have to have that. I, I don't see any other way around that. you, Larry? No, um, because the, the, the uh, bioreactors that we're looking at, actually, they use a, a fiber mesh and um, to, to prevent air bubbles or, or prevent the uh, spirulina from uh, not being able to access the air. Um, and the fiber mesh inside the, the, contain, the container portion where the uh, inoculum with the feed is located will help prevent that. Um, and uh, like I said, other, another university has utilized that to strictly off of uh, spirulina growth and they had decent success with it. 
Okay, yeah, it's now the top of the hour and the next workshops are starting. So yeah, I wanna thank both of you guys for presenting here. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending.